So this work um, is distributed into a Creative Commons license. Is that right, Nia? Mm -hmm. So it means that you have the right to uh, reuse and modify this material at the condition that you indicate the source of the materials and what you modified. So we are going to start the module two, which is called finding over overrepresented pathway in gene list. And this module will cover the statistical methods that are used in pathway enrichment. So we are covering the conceptual knowledge that is behind all the tools that we are going to see today, because there are many tools that are available for enrichment uh, pathway analysis. And we think that if you know the theory behind it, you will be able to choose your own tool after the workshop. And also when you run an enrichment tool, you will be able to adjust the parameters correctly. And most importantly, you are going to correctly interpret the results. So this lecture is a little bit of theory, a little bit of statistics, but after that, it's going to be more fun because you are going to try uh, the tools in the practical labs. So uh, let's start by the general workflow of enrichment analysis and definitions. So this is the, the list of our learning objectives uh, for today. So the overall goal of the lecture is to understand the concept of overrepresentation analysis. We will learn to differentiate between a defined gene list and a ranked gene list because that will tell us which enrichment task to use. We are going to review the concepts of p-value and corrected p-value in the context of enrichment analysis. And I hope that at the end of the lecture, you will be able to understand correctly the result of an enrichment test. So here is a summary of the workflow of the pathway and network enrichment analysis. Sorry. So you see that there are three steps. So the first step, steps, this is when you generate your omics data. And this is the step where you estimate which data points, could be genes, proteins, or lipids, are significantly different from the background noise in your experiment. So this step is done by applying the correct statistical method to your data. And if you do it well, then you remove a lot of noise in your data, which is very important for your further downstream analysis. So our first tip here is that you take a lot of care in this step where um, you analyze your data and you remove your, no the, your noise. Then for the, for the step two, this is where you are going to use bioinformatics method to unbiasedly interpret your data. So what we are going to do is that we are going to query our gene list against some uh, biological processes that we call the pathways. You also can query your gene list, again, other sources of information like drug targets and disease, disease if it's appropriate for your project. Then, then the step three is when you do the network visualization of your enrichment results. We do it because it's then easier to interpret. And this is at that step that we generate new hypotheses. So it's opening for future directions. And for sure, we need to validate experimentally in the web lab. For example, we can take some inhibitors of the pathway that we found interesting. So here is how this module integrates with the workflow of the um, workshop. So on module one, um, Gary told you about how to get generate links for your gene list for your omics data. And uh, he talked about the pathway database in the recorded video. So this is going to be the two elements uh, for the pathway enrichment analysis. So we started with the omics data that we normalized and uh, we analyzed statistically, then we get our gene list. This is our first element. And the second, the second element is the gene set. So the gene set, set um, store the prior knowledge about the function of these genes, and it's stored in pathway database. And the gene set like, is, a, is a format. So basically for the cell cycle, the cell cycle gene, gene set would be the name cell cycle, followed by the names of the genes that are included in the cell cycle. 
So these two elements, gene list and gene set, they can only talk to each other if you use this, the, um, the same gene identifiers. So if you use Ansible ID in your gene list, then you, you have to make sure that your pathway database is formatted with Ansible IDs. If you, did, if you formatted your gene list with um, human symbols or any gene symbols, gene names, then make sure that your pathway database also use the gene names. So then the third step is the pathway enrichment analysis, where we look for over-representation analysis. It means that we are looking for an over-enrichment of our pathway in our gene list. So that's the module two. And then for the next module of the uh, workshop, we are going to visualize this result as a network. And we also are going to learn how to add multiple layers to a network which is also, uh, let's say, the positive aspect of the network. So you have first your enrichment analysis, and then you can add other layers like gene expression values or uh, the mere targets or transcription fa factor targets, depending on your project. So here is another visualization of the pathway enrichment analysis, because sometimes we think it's very difficult, but it's actually a way to organize a gene list into different categories. So I have my gene list on the left, and I can see that I can divide the gene list based on the biological process. So for example, the gene in black, they belong to accent guidance, the gene in green to the aging process, in purple, the stem cell development, and in blue, the cell migration. So now it's going to be way easier for me to understand the, the results of my experiments because instead of focusing on many genes, I just focus my attention on four biological processes to derive new hypotheses. So this slide illustrates the important concept of overlap that is used to calculate the enrichment score when we talk about overrepresentation analysis. So we have here the gene list. So my gene list is uh, contains 41 genes, and this is the pathway accent guidance that we are testing. The original size of this pathway is 39 genes. So we see that there is a overlap of 13 genes between my gene list and the pathway, which represent about one quarter of my gene list. So that's the first value that can create an enrichment score. In addition to the simple concept of overlap, we also can add a score associated to each value of the genes. And if in my overlap, I have a lot of genes with, with, with a high score, that's going to increase my enrichment score. So for example, we can rank all our genes using uh, this scoring system. For RNA-seq, we are going to see that's going to be like, um, like the, the four change or uh, the p-value. So the background is also another uh, important concept when we speak about overrepresentation analysis. So the background here, like in uh, golden, represent all the genes that we could measure um, during our experiment. So the genes that we could not capture in our omics data should be discarded from the background. So when we do like RNA-seq or ATAC-seq, it's usually whole genome. So we don't have too much issue with the background. But if we do like a custom array or a nanostring where we put on the, the, the string, the nanostring only immune genes, then the background should be only the immune genes that were put on the array. And for the RNA-seq to be more accurate, the background should be only the genes that are expressed in our cells. So to, to have an idea of these genes, then we can simply remove the genes that have low counts or equal to counts to zero. So some definition. So what is overrepresentation analysis? So usually we say the pathway is enriched in our gene list. So what does it mean? So there are several um, it means that there are several or many genes in this pathway in our gene list. Or a more accurate definition is there are more genes from this pathway in our gene list than what we could have obtained by chance only. And this is the last definition that we are going to explore in the next slides. 
So we are going to start by the, by the enrichment analysis using a defined gene list. So that brings us to the outline of this lecture, which describes the workflow of an enrichment analysis. So we will first learn that we have two workflows depending of we have of if we have a defined gene list or a ranked gene list. And depending on that, it will use two different tests, the Fisher's exact test for the defined gene list and the rank sum test in GACA for the ranked gene list. But they both end up with very similar outputs that we have a p-value associated with each pathway that we have tested. And this p-value assesses the probability that uh, this pathway is enriched in my gene list by chance only. Because we do multiple uh, multiple tests, we, we test multiple pathway, I'm sorry, we need to correct um, the p-value form. Multiple hypothesis testing. Let's take break. So what's the difference between a defined gene list and a ranked gene list? So a gene list uh, would be, sorry, I'm um, a bit of a sore throat. Don't hang on. Okay, so difference between defined gene list and ranked gene list. So the defined gene list is thresholded. So we select a fixed number of genes, could be 200 genes or 500 genes. And the question that we are going to answer is, are any pathways surprisingly enriched in my gene list? And the test is going to be a Fisher's exact test. For a ranked gene list, we are going to rank all genes in the genomes using a score, like differential expression value. And the questions that we are going to answer is, any pathway ranked surprisingly high or low in my ranked gene list. And the test that we are going to use is GACA and the rank sum test. Excuse me. Uh, so when you say rank, I say that you rank the genes based on which one is more expressed, which is less expressed. Yeah. So if you have two groups, like treated and controlled, and then you are going to rank them by the most upregulated to the most downregulated. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm very sorry, but you need to have my throat. Uh, <laughs> it's better, right? But if you have, um, if you don't have two groups, there is what we call a uh, single cell, single sample GSEA, when we rank all the genes from high abundance or high expression to low expression. So there are two different types of ranking. Yeah. <laughs> So we are going to start example one, which is an example with a defined gene list. And it's coming from a single cell proteomics. So we have we are starting with the same cell line from a patient with um, acute myeloid leukemia, which is a type of blood cancer. And at the same as single cell RNA, we have clustered all the cells and represented this in a two-dimensional graph. So we can see that we have four groups and uh, we are more interested by the cells of group A and the cells of group B. So we have the matrix of the cells. So we have all the cells as columns and all the gene names as rows. So what we can do is we um, get all the cells from cluster A on the left and all the cells from cluster B on the right. And now, we can do uh, calculate the differential abundance between these proteins, between cluster A and cluster B. So we end up by having two defined gene lists, which are the top 20 proteins of cluster B and the top 20 proteins of cluster A. And now we want to interpret this gene list in an unbiased way using G-Profiler. So we copy and paste our list in G-Profiler we get um, the list of pathways that are significantly enriched. And then the next step will be to visualize um, these results as a network. So here I would want you to, to uh, um, show you what a pathway file looks like, because it's very simple. So if you open your pathway file in a text editor, 
you will see that <coughs> sorry that it's a list of um, pathways so we, you have the pathway names and then you have all the genes in each pathway so here it's our gene list on the left the top 20 proteins of cluster b and then we look we say that the first step is to look at the overlap between the gene list and the pathway. So we have here this pathway where there is like an overlap of four between our gene list and the pathway. So the first step was to find this overlap. So here it's 13 between my gene list in pink and my pathway in blue. So 13 genes, but the Second question that is coming is that, is this overlap larger than the one that we could have found expect, uh, by, by random chance only? So to answer this question, what we could do is we could do random permutation. So we could um, generate 1,000 random gene lists, calculate the overlap, and calculate um, how many times this overlap is larger than the one that we got with the random gene list, and that's called the empirical p-value, and I put the formula at the bottom here. The, the issue with the, with the permutations is that we need to do a lot of permutation to get a good precision for the p-value, and it takes a lot of time for the computer to run. Maybe it can take one hour to run, and also it can take some computer resources. But luckily, in this some cases, uh, what we can do is to know the null distribution that fits our data. And is the case with the pathway enrichment analysis. Um, the probability, uh, this hypergeometric probability distribution of the Fisher's exact test will model correctly the data. So we can use the statistic, statistical test directly and not uh, building our own distribution, uh, our own um, null distribution. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. So the previous one, the empirical p-value, mm -hmm. that, that number is basically dependent on the how many genes are in my gene list, right? It's, you, you, you're asking it against the whole genome, and the only number that varies basically is how many genes are you pairing. Is that right? Well, that's what we are going to to see. So it's a, it's a very good question. Actually, the, the elements that are important is the overlap between your gene list. And you will see we have examples. The number, the size of the overlap between your gene list and the pathway, but the size of the pathway is going to matter as well. The size of the gene list, as well as the size of the background. All the four values in the Fisher's exact test formula will give you the p-value. So we see here uh, in this example, so we will have uh, 5,000 like marbles in a bag, and we will say that those are genes. So we have way more red genes than black genes, and the black genes, like 500 black genes, will, would represent a pathway that we are testing. And this is our gene list. And our gene list has uh, four black balls and one red uh, gene, like, like four black gene and one red gene. So we know that it's kind of unlikely to get these results by chance only. So this is the probability distribution here. So um, on the y-axis, you can see the values of the um, for the probability. So to get five red genes, we know that the probability is very high. To get four black genes and one red gene, we know that the probability is very low. So if we do the sum of the probabilities, we get the p-value, which is 0 0.001, which is very low. So it means it's very unlikely to get this result by chance only. So now I'm going to show you uh, the formula of the Fisher's exact test, and it's related to, to your questions. So you, you see some numbers. You see m, x, t, and k. So x is um, the overlap, so the size of the overlap between your gene list and your pathway. K is your uh, the length of your gene list. M is the size of the pathway. And T is the size of the universe, the background, all the genes that you could measure. So all these four values will enter in the formula to get your p-value. So 
So um, that's the G profiler output. So we copy and paste a gene list. Then it's a very typical output where you have the list of the each of the pathway with their name. What we can see here is that they are coming from the Go BP database. So BP is for, for biological process. We have the Go ID to retrieve um, more information about the process. And then here I put the p-value associated with each process. Here, the mi minus log 10 of p, let's say we talk about the p-value now, um, will transform a very small p-value into a very high score. That's what the minus log 10 is going to do. And then here we have the terms t, q, t, and q, and u, that I hope now you are going to understand based on the Fisher's exact test. So T will be the, the size of the pathway that was called M in the previous um, formula. Q is the size of the gene list, what was called K in the previous formula. T and Q, which was the X, so the overlap between my gene list and the pathway, and U is the size of the universe. This example comes from the single proteomics experiment. And for the single cell proteomics experiment, I didn't have all the prote proteins like uh, of, of the, the genome because it was very sparse. So I've, I used here the default background, but that's not completely accurate. I should have put all the proteins that could have been detected in my single cell protein assay. So then this slide illustrates uh, how the p-value can vary uh, with these um, four values that I told you, the, the, the t, um, the m, and the k, and the x. So here we have in blue the gene list, which is 51 genes. So here, the, this pathway, active filament-based process, has the lowest p-value. And we see that it has also the largest overlap compared to the other. So we understand that the lowest p-value comes from the fact that that had a larger overlap, like 21 out of 51 genes. But this one, 10, 10, 10, they all have the same overlap size, but their p-value is different. So in this case, you can see it's because the pathway length was different. So if you have, if you have a, lo a larger pathway, but your overlap stay as small, then for sure it's going to decrease your p-value. So an, another example with the non-significant genes, I have here three non-significant results. I mean, this one is was the significant, but this last two, they were not significant. So you can see that the overlap was very small, like four in the overlap, and here one gene in the overlap. But I would like to pay you to pay attention to the p-value because it was still 0 0.05 and 0 0.06. So may, you may say, well, I think that's okay because this is close to significant. So what I would like you to pay attention after this workshop is not looking only at the p-value, but try to look at all these terms. So the size of the overlap, the size of your gene list, and the size of the pathway that you are testing to have a better sense of, okay, I think that have robust data, or maybe I have to be cautious. So the p-value assesses the probability that the tested pathway is enriched in our gene list by chance only, only but we are testing many pathways at the same time. So we will have to correct for multiple hypothesis testing. So to understand this concept, we are going back to our examples with the red genes and the black genes. So you remember that when we did that and we obtained um, we say that to obtain four black genes and one red gene, it was very unlikely, and the p-value was 0 0.001. But it's because we tried it once. If I tell you, try it, try to get five genes out of this bag until you get five black genes and one red gene, at one point you are going to make it. So the more tests you are going, we are going to make, the less likely, the more likely we are going to have these unlikely results. 
So that's why we are uh, correcting for multiple hypotheses. And if we don't do it, we are going to generate type one error, also named false positive. So an intuitive way to do it would be then to multiply the p-value by the number of tests that we are making. And this is called the Bonferroni correction. So let's say here, the GoBP pathway had a total of 349 pathways. We tested all the pathways in the GoBP database. So then what we are going to do to do the Bonferroni correction, we are going to multiply the original p-value by the number of pathway in the database. And the resulting adjusted p-value is going to be always higher than the original p-value because that's the goal. However, this correction is very stringent. So if you try it, it could be that like nothing passed the threshold, that like you have no significance. But there is another method that exists and it's wide, widely used and it's called the false discovery rate. So the FDR is the expected proportion of the observed enrichment due to random chance. So when you have an FDR and then you select your pathway under FGR 0 0.05. Let's say you have 30 pathway that passed your threshold of 0 0.05. It means that you have 5% of this pathway that are probably false positive, but you don't know which one. It also could be that you have no pathway that are false positive and they are true positive. It's just a theory. So that's an example of how to calculate um, the FDR. So you first ranked all your p-value for all your pathway from smallest to largest. And then you calculate the adjusted p-value by multiplying the, your original p-value by the number of tests, so the, all the pathway that we have tested, divided by the rank. So we can see here that the last one we, di we divide by the number of tests divided by the rank because it's the last one is going to be one. So it's not going to change the result. So meaning that the FDR is meant to correct only where, where it's needed at the beginning, like at the most significant p-value. So it's like it's not like even Bonferroni would uh, correct everything. It's like you cut the grass at the same level, but um, the, the FDR, it will correct more for the very low p-value where you have more chance to have false positive. And then for the final um, FDR value, you just choose the p-value that is equal uh, to the, the same rank that is smaller to or equal to the sm small rank or to the lower. So here we test this one, for example. This and you look at this rank and the rank below that, this rank is smaller, so you take it at your FDR. So now you have your FDR and then you can select all the pathway, for example, that have a value of 0 0.05 or less. So now this, this, this is the output of G-Provider. When I saw you, show you the showed you the, the output of G-Provider a few, few slides ago, I had calculated the p-value myself because G-Provider will output direct to, directly the, the adjusted p-value. So now that we have seen this defined geo list and the main elements of it, even if I showed you G-Provider, my aim is that after the workshop, you can look at any enrichment tools that you want and you can think about these values and interpret. So we are going to try it on EnrichR, which is another enrichment tool. So we see first, we are going to look for the list of the pathway with the names. So that's our first element. Maybe the second element would be the pathway database. So which pathway database? We see here, that's the, the, the go. And I think, uh, yeah, so is it go BP? Is it like bio, biological process? Is it go CC, cellular component? So you have to look for that information. And for any tools, there will be, some value associated with the overlap size. So the size of the overlap. So they might be slightly different for different tools, but try to look for the value that 
tells you if it's a big overlap or a small overlap. And then you will have the p-value, the nominal p-value, and the adjusted p-value. And sometimes you have the name of the genes, which can be also um, very handy. So that's a last uh, example with Panther. So Panther, I think, is using a ghostly biological process. So again, we see the names of the pathway. Sometimes it outputs only the pathway that are significant. And sometimes you can play with the threshold to show more pathways. Then you have the size of the overlap, the p-value, and the corrected p-value. So now that we have uh, finished the section on enrichment analysis using a defined gene list, we are going to start the second section, with it, which is enrichment analysis using a range gene list. So this is the second workflow here. So rank gene list, GSEA, p-value, and um, correction for multiple hypothesis testing. So why do we test in rank gene list? We always try to test in rank gene if it's possible. It is recommended because it avoids the problem of thresholding. So it avoids us to put an arbitrary threshold to select the genes. Do we take the, the top 200? Do we take the top 500? Do we choose p-value 0 0.01 or 0 0.05? Because if we are too permissive and um, we select like a long gene list, we can also choose um, false positive. But if we are very stringent and say, okay, I'm just select my, my top 100 at p-value 0.01, we, we may miss a lot of information. But if we have a ranked gene list, then we don't have these issues. So for this section, I'm showing the example two of um, enrichment analysis using RNA-seq uh, expression, so bulk RNA-seq. We have two groups, the control and the treated. The treated, um, are done by overexpression and transcription factors. So I can do a rank gene list. We are going to learn how to do it, to rank all my genes from my top upregulated in my treated to the top downregulated in my treated. And it's very important that you leave all the non-significant genes in the middle. So then once you have your rank gene list, you input in the tool GSEA that we are going to, to try. You are going to have your list of pathway at the end. And then the next step is to create an enrichment map. Then you analyze your enrichment map and then you find uh, some pathway of interest and then you focus on this pathway and then you continue your research project. So, this slide is going to explain how to generate the rank gene list. So I first start with my matrix. And then I calculate the differential expression genes between my treated and my control samples. I can do it um, in R using, for example, package like HR or ds 2 And both will give you an output table for all genes. So try to have the output for all the genes, not only the significant one. And if you work with a bioinformatician and they gave you only the significant one, the FDR 0.05, you, you, you can tell them to give you the full list. So in this table, that could be HR or DS2, you will have a log four chain value column, a p-value column. And based on these two columns, we are going to generate a score. So we want a score that is high for the upregulated genes, positive and high. And we want a score that is negative for the downregulated genes. So we are going first to transform the, the p-value into like the, a small p-value into a high score using the minus log 10. So that's this part of the equation, minus log 10 of the p-value. But if we do that, we don't have a sign. So we want to see if our genes is upregulated or downregulated. So that's why we multiply the formula by the sign of the log for change. So now we can rank from upregulated to downregulated. You can do this in R or in Excel. So it is Muta and all who developed GSEA in 2003. They were studying diabetes 
and they came out with the GACA algorithm that showed the down regulation of the oxidative phosphorylation pathway. And <coughs> what is interesting is that in this pathway, all the genes were down, but just a little bit. So they were not significantly down. So if they would have used a defined gene list, they would not have, have included these genes in their results. But using GACA, they could see that the sum of all these subtle changes in the genes had a strong effect on the pathway. So they could validate this also experimentally. So that's why it's sometimes important to use a ranked gene list and not a threshold gene list because you can add up subtle changes. And so GSEA uses, uses a modified Kolmogorov Smirnov test. So now we are going to see how GACA calculates the enrichment score. So we have our rank list on the left from top up to top down with all the genes again, even including the non-significant. And so now the rank list is placed uh, horizontally here. So we have the top uh, genes, the upregulated genes on the left, the downregulated genes on the right and the non-significant in the middle. So we start with gene one and we are testing uh, like any pathways. So we start uh, with gene one and we look if the gene one is in the pathway or not. If the gene one is in the pathway, we are, we are going to put a vertical bar here and we are going to increase the sum a little bit. If gene two is not in the pathway, the sum is going to decrease a little bit. So that we understand that if we have a lot of genes in the pathway at the top of the rank file, then the sum is going to increase very rapidly to form a peak. And the maximum of the peak, this is what is called the enrichment score. And so I have the enrichment score here. I put a line and now I look at all the genes in black that are in my rank list and the gene set, and this is what we call the leading edge genes, so genes that were important for the calculation of the enrichment score. So I basically think that all these genes are important. So this is to zoom in and to see that this is my gene one is in the gene list, so the sum increase. This gene, gene two and, and three are not in the pathway, so the, the, the sum decreased just slightly and then up and down, so until the peaks is the peaks are forming. We can have positive and negative enrichment score. So this is a positive peak and this is a negative peak. So for the positive peak, uh, the genes in the pathway are upregulated in my rank file, so they are at the left of the rank file, and for the negative peak, so the genes, let's say, are downregulated in my comparison. So now that we have uh, calculated the enrichment score, uh, we still need to go to a p-value and then an FGR. So GSEA is doing this by doing permutation, so a, a null distribution. So mostly not, mostly in the case that we are using, what we are going to permute is the pathway. So we are assigning random genes to the pathway, and we do it about 1,000 times or 2,000 times. So that helps us to build the null distribution that you see here in purple. And then we have our real enrichment score, and we look if the real enrichment score is far away from the null distribution. In this case, it means it's very unlikely to get this result by chance only. There is another technique of permutation where you label the where you shuffle the labels and you basically create one thousand um, random rank file, and it helps to break gene dependency. So you can have two techniques for that. So now we are going to see a few examples to when to choose a rank list and not rank list, or when you when it's possible to use a rank list because it's always the preferred method, but sometimes you cannot, so you have to use a defined gene list. Yes. A question to the GSCA. Yes. So you mentioned that um, some of the subtle, subtle changes in gene expression add up, right? Yes. So how do you define a subtle change? Does it mean that it's significant, but it's very small? So. Something I, I forgot to tell you is that there is a weight system in GACA. So because I told you that at the middle of the rank file, 
here you have the non-significant genes. Here, so you don't want to pick like in the middle, yeah? But subtotal would be that, let's say, let's say I put a threshold, I don't know, do you see here? At 0 0.05, yeah? Let's say in my head. So all this one, they would be significant. You would have got them in the defined gene list, but they are all the other one that are maybe 0 0.051, 0 0.053. 0 so then if I add up, I have a gene here at the top under the 0 0.05 and maybe 10, but I have a few other just behind that threshold. It will still participate in the running sum here. So we will, you know, we don't forget about these genes. They will, they will, they will help the enrichment score to go up. So, so when I uh, but, mentioned, we have to put hmm? into the middle the non-significant genes. This hmm. basically happens naturally when you rank them from the height. Yeah, you don't, score. you don't exclude everything, but. GACA will not count this one for the running sum because there is a weight. So at the beginning, the sum increase a lot because it depends on your ranked. But when you come at the middle, GACA will not put a lot of weight. So for genes in the middle, there's not an increase in the running sum. So it has to be right after the FDO 0, 0 0.05 threshold to participate to the, to the peak. So it's a way to rescue these genes that are borderline in terms of FGR. Um, so a few examples. So we know when we can have a ranked gene list or a defined gene list. So this, all these three uh, examples are for the ranked gene list. So for RNA-seq, whenever you can, you can do a ranked gene list, especially when you have two groups, controlled and treated, you rank all your genes by differential expression. For single cell RNA-seq, it's actually very similar to uh, the RNA-seq. You can, uh, for example, uh, calculate your pseudobulk and compare maybe your cluster one versus your cluster two, and you generate your rank file. It's also possible with label-free proteomics, uh, when you have about 5,000 proteins or more, then in this case, it's also you can also do differential abundance of your protein between your group one and your group two and your rank list. Three cases where you have to use a defined gene list. That could be then you start with point case DNA and you're looking for uh, mutations and you are looking for uh, frequently mutated genes, then in different patients, then you end up with a list of genes that are carrying this mutation so that your only way to do it is with a defined gene list. Another way is when you do the, a time course of cluster analysis. So let's say you have um, like RNA expression, you have a matrix on time point, you have um, three samples for time point one, three samples for time point two, and four time points. And what you, you are doing is yeah, you're looking for the uh, pattern of expression uh, in your data. So you will have a group of genes that go up, a group of genes that go down, and some genes that go up and down. So you have categorized your genes into these four categories. Then you have four list of genes for these categories. So in this case, it's only a defined gene list. Another one, for example, you have ataxic and shipsic. So you compare the two. You want to find the overlap between your ataxic peaks and your chipsic peaks. So then you have a lot of peaks, like a bunch of peaks, and um, that are in the overlap of the ataxic and the chipsic. You associate the genes that are in these peaks or near these peaks, and you get your defined gene list. So as I was telling you, like there are many available enrichment analysis tools, and uh, they're coming from different formats. Some are web-based, some are in the Cytoscape app, some are standalone package like uh, GACA, and some are including in R. But what we have seen today is that whatever tool that you are going to use, there is a typical output. And the typical output is a table, with the pathway name, number of overlapping genes, number of genes in the pathway, the p-value, and the FDR. 
So sometimes the table can be quite long with many pathway. And an important fact is that in this pathway, there are many genes in common between the pathway, but using a table, you are not be going to be able to see this information. So you that's why we are going to learn to do network visualization. So now our tips on how to choose a tool. So uh, there are a few questions that you can answer. So does it cover your model organism? Is there a good choice of gene set? So can you choose uh, one database or can you choose multiple database? Like is that or maybe Reactome, GoBP, or any other database? Are the pathway database up to date? So that's very important to see if your tool is maintained and if they do like a monthly or once per year update on the underlying database because you want to try to work with accurate information. And now I think you are going to be able to see which stat statistic do they use. So it's more like a Fisher's exact test for a defined gene list, or is it more like a ransom test and uh, something like GACA? And then you can see what's the best for your data. Is this description of the statistic clear enough? So can you really answer this question? And do you like the output style? And then for us in this workshop, can you connect this with network visualization tools like Cytoscape? So this is the example of four tools that we are going to use during the workshop. Um, no, I mean one tool, but this is four tool. And then uh, we compare with the criteria. So G profile is the one that we choose. So I try to put all the criteria here. And then, so I try to answer the question. So. Does G Profiler have updated database? Yes, it updates uh, each month. Choice of the database. Is it more than one database that I can choose? Yes. G Profiler offers more than one database. We will see it offers like, like maybe five. Do, do we test database individually or together? We can do individually or we can do together. I can say, okay, I'm going to try and just test GoBP. Or maybe I can try to test GoBP and React together to get more comprehensive results. Does it um, the, the, does it work with multiple model organisms? Yes. Possible, possibility to upload your own custom pathway database? Yes. So that's very also useful. For example, if you focus on a few uh, pathway of interest that you have discovered from a previous study, you can build your own GMT file with only the pathway that you want to test and upload this and run G Profiler. Um, there is also the possibility to upload your custom background, which is a very important. So again, if you work on a nano string, then you can upload your custom back background and for sure, does it cover multiple hypothesis testing? So uh, G Profiler, it's a web app and it's you can connect it with Cytoscape so Enrichment Map. So um, sometimes, so we usually do over enrichment of the features exact tests, but some in very rare cases, some people they want to, to test under enrichment. So what's not enriching our gene list, so it's still possible to do. And uh, the Fisher's exact test is often called a hypergeometry test because some tests, they use approximation of the Fisher's exact test. And uh, there are other statistics that we could uh, that we could use and that we can, can see sometimes, for example, the binomial test. In Reactome tomorrow, we are going to see the binomial test, which is also very uh, close to the Fisher's exact test in the theory. So for the rank list, uh, I put here two tools, GACA, the one that we are going to use in the workshop, and Panther, which is also using a Wilcoxum rank sum test, which is also a very interesting test when you have a rank gene list and you want to do path enrichment analysis. All right, quick question. Uh, so I read the paper from uh, Chico and Agapito et al., and then they, they did give tips how to do the enrichment analysis, and they suggest that we should use multiple of these tools to see the if the results over like for now. So, do these tools differ in any kind of you know algorithms they use? I, I, I so I try this. I try to even the one that I I showed you this. Yeah. I really tried. I put the same gene list and I try to I try if I could to to put the same pathway database. Yeah. Um, 
it's difficult for example panther use like a slim version of go so that's sometimes you have the first step here where you cannot really compare because the database are not exactly the same and they're not exactly the same version as well and then the fisher's exact test they don't use the exact fisher's exact test that because the Fisher exact test has a lot of factorials, so it takes a lot of time to run. So they do approximation. So that's you have two factors here. And then, so the overlap is not 100%. I was quite surprised to see that my overlap was a bit smaller than expected. And also, the reason is that you choose a threshold to say, okay, I'm just looking at the, the top pathways. You know, so I, I've selected the threshold. My overlap was a bit smaller than I was expecting. But uh, so it's not 100%. But if it's robust, you know, if your pathway is robust enough, yeah. you, you should see it. But it's not 100% that all the pathways are going to be there in all the tools. So is it like really right? Is it in the field that you need to run the analysis with two, three tools and then say that we tried three and we think the best? Or so I think you could do that if, yeah. Myself, I go with the theory and I try to, all the criteria that I told you in the lecture, I try to choose a tool that corresponds to this criteria. So then I trust the tool and I trust the results compared to other tool where the statistic is not very well described in, in the paper. And they say to modify Fisher's exact test, but I don't, I don't understand what they modified. So that's the why how I go with it because you can compare with different tools, but what about if your tools are not done cor correctly? So, so that's why we are trying to give you all these concepts so that you know which tool to, to choose. So this one is the Wilcoxon Ransom test from Panther. It's also a very interesting test. The Wilcoxon Ransom test, we will look at the difference in two distributions between the, the older genes and the genes in the pathway that we you are testing. So here we have a two dimension, the log 14 on the x-axis and the gene rank on, on, on the y-axis. And in red, this is the, the genes in the pathway. So because they contain a lot of genes that are upregulated, you see this shift in the distribution. So as a summary, we have seen the Fisher's exact test for defined gene list and the GSEA or recalc some rank some test for computing um, enrichment p-value for rank gene list. So we have two recipe, one recipe for defined gene list and one for rank gene list. They are very similar. First, you define your gene list for the defined gene list and your background. You select your pathways, you run the Fisher's exact test, you correct for multiple hypothesis testing, then you select the pathway under uh, FDR threshold, and then you interpret the results. And for the rank your list, you rank your, your list, and you select your pathway, you run a test, you correct for multiple hypothesis testing. There are some topics that were not covered in this lecture some more advanced topic that the correlation between the gene set, the dependency of the genes, some tools like ROST and camera try to address these issues. Um, there are many tools, I mean, not many, there are a few tools now that try to be topology aware of the, the pathway, like the upstream and downstream events. And I would say that many modern, modern tools are now trying to include some network visualization in the output directly. If you want more information, you can go and read the reference paper uh, that I think we put in the pre-work as well. So the last two tips is be precise at each step of your analysis, especially the first one when you do the statistical analysis to remove the noise and try to answer one biological question at a time. And these two extra slides is to, if you want to better understand the FGO, or the Fisher's exact test that I put this as um, a reference. So do you have other questions? <laughs>